Adventurers, buckle up and get ready for the Albion Online devs have just dropped a dev talk about the Foundations update. The update that drops in less than two weeks. So yeah, a lot of information. Let's check it out together. Alright, the adventurers, this is the dev talk right here. This is the thumbnail for it. Let's begin. Hello and welcome to Greetings Traveler Online Dev Talk. In today's video, I want to go in depth with the new territory fortifications coming to Albion Online. With the launch of the Foundations right. update on April 15th. Something that I want to point out. I've noticed this the first time I watched it because we had some audio problems and I had to rewind it on Twitch. Sorry, Twitch guys. But something that I pointed out the first time and I want to point it out uh, again right now is this right here. I want you to see how the walls, the player built walls, are blending with the environment. Coming Super interesting online. stuff. Look at this. Happens over there as well. Happens over there as well. With the launch of the Foundations update on April 15th, all guild territories in Albion Online will receive an updated layout. These layouts define the natural obstacles and possible fortification upgrades in that territory. This is something that I don't understand. And I've asked this question the first time, I want to point it out again because it's kind of, kind of a weird thing. So as far as I know, the territory is this box right there, this square. Inside of this square, can't you place everything? Like, uh, don't you make everything yourself? It seems like that's not the case because, again, you have those environmental walls that are blending in with the player-built walls that are somewhat forcing you to go with a specific layout. It's kind of a shame because they're not really player-built in that situation. Like, essentially, imagine this. Imagine the game gives you a castle and allows you to upgrade that castle. It's cool, but it's not a castle that you built. It's a castle that you upgrade. And that seems to be the situation over here, which is pretty disappointing if that's actually the case. But you see what I mean, like those um, natural walls, I'm going to call them, they are there from the start. So you cannot do much, it seems. I mean, you can modify the shape a little bit, but I'm not sure how much freedom you have. In total, there are five different layouts. And there are specified layouts that are only upgradable for the moment. Oh, that's what they said. At the beginning of the season, Let's see. territories will begin I didn't to watch the whole thing. fortification points, a new per-territory resource, which resets at the end of each season. The amount of fortification points generated in a territory depends on the territory energy level. Okay. Players with the Manage Fortifications Guild permission can use these fortification points to start upgrades in the territory. In the Foundations update, there are three different fortification elements players can upgrade. Walls, gates and guards. Clicking on a guard will open the upgrade UI for a group of guards, which displays the cost as well as the effects of... That's super interesting. You know what I'm thinking? Are you free to move those guards? Like for example, this guard automatically spawns over there? Or can I place it over here? Or wherever I want? You know what I'm afraid of adventurers, and the more I go into this video, the more this confirms my fear. I'm afraid that instead of getting something actually player built, we're getting something already built by the game, everything is already established, every single detail, every single object placement, everything is already established, but we're just making it shinier and shinier and shinier. And that's a shame. That's a shame. Because okay, I understand, maybe you cannot allow me to build the walls however I want, but at least allow me to move those. They spawn in specific areas. That is such a shame. That is such a shame. Do they roam around? Upgrading guards. Once confirmed, the silver cost. Because if you, if you don't have premium, if you don't have freedom, then it's not actually something that you build. Like you're basically just making this wall uh, go from a wooden wall to a stone wall, a tier eight stone wall, which is nice, but. I mean, is that it? <laughs> is taken from the guild account and the guild Sandbox, exactly. Like, a very good way of saying it. Somebody in the chat said that. Yeah, like, this is not sandbox. Allow me to move those things however I want. I understand. You might not allow me to move the bank or the, the final boss. Okay, but the mobs? Allow me to move them. Guards upgrade immediately. You can only upgrade each guard group. Uh, I think only GMs will build this. 99% of players will never touch a castle for the entire duration they play the game. Mm, yes, but that's still better than having the game have the castle. That's the thing. Like, if the game already makes the castle, kind of sucks. <laughs> Whereas if the Guildmaster makes the castle, okay, yeah, for the average player, it's not a big difference. But it's a big difference for the Guildmaster. 
group once a day, however. Upgrade okay, what? wait, what? Cards upgrade immediately. You can only upgrade each card group once a day. However. Yeah, I don't like this either. Look at that. I don't like this either. Because this creates an artificial time prolonging mechanism. Essentially, okay, how can you keep players in a game for longer? Or how can you keep players returning in a game? Well, you can keep them playing by having those time gates or by making a good game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, if I have all the resources, if I have all the materials, allow me to upgrade. Wanna add a time gap? Like, wanna make sure that I don't upgrade it 10 times per day? Well, require me to grind a lot. Ask me to gather a lot of materials and make, make the player that's grinding feel rewarded not locked behind the players that are not grinding because this affects everybody like a, a casual player can probably farm the materials for those or a casual guild i should say could probably farm the materials or the requirements for those gods in 20 hours a hardcore guild could farm it in like 10 hours or something like that allow them to be faster because they're not casual otherwise it feels horrible for the hardcore players creating walls and gates works similarly Clicking on them will display which walls and gates are within the selected upgrade group and this How does the upgrading group actually works? I'm very curious about that Walls and gates are within the selected upgrade group and displays the upgrade costs and improvements Unlike guard upgrades walls and gate upgrades always take until the end of the next territory prime time to complete So there's no way to upgrade your walls in response to a declared attack that's good. See, this time gate, I can understand. This time gate, I can totally, totally, totally understand. So what's the point of upgrading your defenses? Well, during... But the guards, I really don't see it. Uh, maybe it's the same reason, actually. So that you cannot upgrade the guards... Uh, yeah, it might actually be the same reason. So that you cannot not upgrade your guards in the middle of an attack. But at the same time, they could have freezed it the same. Time, <laughs> would have been better. And gates simply prevent your enemy from just walking into your territory. An enemy will have to destroy them with a siege hammer to gain access to your territory. Further that's upgrading cool, cool. walls increases their hit points. Defenders are also able to use their siege hammers to repair walls. So having more hit points gives you more time to repair. I love this. I love this. This is a system super similar to Guild Wars 2, and I'm looking to see if it consumes resources. In my opinion, it should consume a whole lot of resources. For an attacker break. Guild Wars 2 has a super interesting system where you have those uh, castles, essentially, and each castle has, like, a, um, a supply area. The supply area gets filled up by some oxes that are essentially NPCs running around the map. You might have to protect them, their caravans, and so on and so forth. Those resources are limited. They're different from the resources available in the game normally. Like, uh, if this would be present in Albion, we wouldn't be talking about stone. We would be talking about a specific resource, kind of like uh, tree hearts, let's say. You know, a specific resource. Uh, now, again, should that be implemented in Albion exactly the same? Absolutely not. But it's just an idea. Okay. It would be super interesting to, um, uh, to have a need to actually do caravans from one spot to the other, to have uh, specific resources that maybe you can craft with stone. It would be really cool Points, to see that. And they come At the same time, it overcomplicates it. With some additional benefits. Each gate has an embedded gate crystal. As long as that crystal is intact, defending players can simply teleport. I guess they did not have a budget for animations, adventurers. The budget for animation, I'm sorry. Can simply teleport. <laughs> it's not there. Through the game, it's not there. Allowing for quick retreats into the territory and fast sally action. Once the crystal is destroyed, this ability is That's lost cool. for the remainder of the fight, and the gate itself can take damage from attackers. Note that defenders can only repair the damaged gate itself, not the crystal. That's cool. That's super cool. Defenders so then if you want to go out, you basically have to open the doors, which means that if you don't kill the enemies, they go in. Open, close fortification gates permission can also open the gates manually, which allows any player to pass through. So be careful when opening the gate, as you might not be able to close it before the attackers rush in. Note that attackers can also open gates from the inside, which opens additional tactical options for attackers. See, there's also something super interesting. In Guild Wars 2, there's multiple ways of approaching a Zerg. Besides the normal strategic ways, there's also what's called portal bombing. Now, I'm not sure how present that is nowadays in Guild Wars 2, but when I played it uh, last time, like five years ago or six years ago, Portal bombing used to be done in the following way. You had a Zerg that distracted the attention of the main Zerg, they were fighting each other and so on and so forth, and a Mesmer would just sneak right behind, drop a portal, 
and through the portal a massive amount of enemies would just come by. Mesmers have essentially the ability to drop um, one end of the portal in one location and the other end of the portal in a different location. And anybody, an indefinite amount of people can actually use that portal to travel from one location to the other. It was so badass and people used to be able to sneak into castles and teleport a zerg inside a castle. Imagine this, you had some enemies just break through your wall and you see one guy running towards you, you don't mind that guy, you're just focused on repairing the wall. That guy, if that guy happens to be a mesmer, he goes right next to you, drops the portal and all of a sudden a hundred players appeared right uh, inside your gates. It would be really interesting if you could have a sneaking mechanism inside those uh, castles, like some way for players to actually sneak inside those castles. I'm not sure how that could be implemented, but it would be really cool. Speaking of attackers, how do you attack fortifications? Well, during most of the day, the territory defenses are shielded from attack by the power of the territory crystal. During prime time, however, by the power of anime, attackers can use the new siege banner item to weaken that protection. To raise a banner, a player with the raise siege banner permission needs to use a siege banner. Let me see, what does that say? Raise a banner, a player with the raise siege banner permission needs to. Let's see, first of all, those are the requirements, so adventurers stack up on those materials that are going to be very necessary. Use this tool to weaken enemy territories, making them attackable. Uh, it is required for raiding or conquering a territory. Use super interesting. The banner from their inventory. And it costs siphon energy, that's super interesting. If they do not have a previously declared attack, they will raise a raid banner, which alerts the defending guild that a raid has started. Bro, this is so good for ZVZ leaders, like for the for the short callers, because you're gonna always see where they are. Finally, man. Because I don't know about you, but the last time I did ZVZs, I could never find the the sh the caller, the short caller. That's super nice. The first At the same time, I am a ZVZ noob, so you know. In minutes of prime time, they will raise a conquest banner. No matter which is raised, the presence of a banner. Look at that, man! It's so visible. I love that. Will begin to degrade the force shield. I wonder if it's also visible for the enemies. I feel like it should be. Protecting the fortification, and allow attackers to begin tearing down walls and gates. There is a limit to how many players are able to attack a wall at once, so attacking armies might want to spread their forces and work on multiple different walls at once. That's awesome, I love that, I love of that. Course, raising a banner alerts the defending guild and allows them to rush through the territory to defend against an incoming attack. In the case of a conquest banner being raised, the territory crystal actually channels its strength into the guards, significantly improving their combat abilities to help with the territory defense. The presence of banners changes how territory battles are being played out in Albion Online. Well, interesting Previously, actually. Whoever controlled the territory tower at the beginning of the prime time would take control of the territory. Now, a raid or an attack only ends once a banner bearer makes it to the territory tower and channels it, or once the defender kills the bearer and controls the banner long enough for it to despawn. That is just cool, man. That is just cool. But won't this make it so that territories right next to the portal cities are very hard to defend? Because the enemies can just keep coming in waves and waves and waves. And considering the fact that the hardest territories to own should be the ones closer to the inner circle, doesn't this kind of fight against that? Oh, just a question. Note, however, that the banner cannot leave the proximity of the territory and is That's cool. on the ground if the bearer leaves the area. If the attackers have... Oh, so I guess that kind of answers my question. Because, okay, if the enemies die, maybe they, are, they might actually have 10 minutes because there are some territories right next to the um, city portal. If not successfully completed a raid or conquest by the end of know. prime time, the battle is declared a victory for the defenders. This new mechanic ensures that the battle for a territory and its fortifications actually happens during the prime time instead of having the attacker occupy a territory and its defenses before the defenders even have a chance to manage. That's super cool actually. That's super cool. Additionally, it ensures that a superior defender has a chance to end an attack early if they defeat the attacking army instead of having to Sorry sit about that. out the entire prime time. 
Finally, in the case of a raid, it ensures there is a clear moment which defines the beginning of a raid and gives defenders a chance to rush back to the fortification before the walls are already broken. That's super good. That's super good because it sucks. It absolutely sucks when you are in one of those situations in which the enemy is attacking and you're not even in the territory yet. Should so that's great. Should any gates break or any guards die during a battle, they will respawn once the attack is over. Should a territory be conquered, however, all of its upgrades are destroyed, but the spent fortification points are transferred that's cool to the new and see what i mean travelers this was the concern that i had at the start so look at how this looks like all with all the upgrades strong. made and look at how it looks like without upgrades unfortunately it absolutely looks like you don't have any freedom whatsoever like yeah, you cannot place your wall anywhere else you're just upgrading existing spots which is a big shame which is a big shame because this does not offer you the freedom that we thought it would Freud. But the spend for that's a big shame that's a big shame to the new owners because it's not player built it's player upgraded allowing them to begin upgrading the territory immediately the fortification upgrades also reset on reset days and at the end of each season this is partially to ensure there's a <laughs> continuous economic need to use stone for territory upgrades but most importantly it allows us to make changes and improvements to the fortification system between seasons oh, that's After good all, this yeah, is an yeah. entirely new system for Albion online yeah. and we'll probably have to tweak it a few times before it is final fair enough but if fortifications reset how do we make sure upgrading them is worthwhile well, first off, the cost of fortification upgrades is based on the quality level of the region. This means upgrading a fortification in a low value region is cheaper and therefore more likely to be worthwhile, even if the income from the territory is not as big. Yes, but at the same time, aren't you very easily attackable? Like if your territory is over there in the portal area, you know, the enemies can just come as in. in higher quality zone. You're always going to be at a disadvantage. Secondly, we're introducing a new territory reward. The activity bonus chest. Oh yes, tell us more this about this. This is located next to the territory tower and is filled once every day at the beginning of the territory's prime time. How it is filled depends on the activity. That's messed up. Okay, those are gonna be in the local Do you region. Scroll down, Robin. As I want to see how much that would be normally. So far over here, we're looking at at least, uh, I would say, two million silver, at least. Maybe let's say 1.5. Connected regions. This means guilds also. So that's not bad at all. In connected static dungeons. Activities which fill the chest include killing mobs as well as gathering and fishing. Basically, any time a loot item is generated or a resource is harvested, there is a chance for the same type of item to also appear in the activity. Bo same type of item. What? That's why you have those, because players generated those items. A legal way of duplicating your items, adventurers? That is awesome. I mean, again, it's not duplication, but that's super cool, actually. So if you loot this in the open world, you're going to place this inside the chest. At the same time, I mean, you have a chance of placing that also in the chest. So essentially, uh, if you loot uh, one silver bag, that one silver bag might also appear inside the chest as well. If you loot this, that might also appear in the chest over here. This is interesting and all, but at the same time, the loot in the open world is pretty bad. So how do you deal with that? I don't know. Regions. This means guilds also benefit from activity in connected static dungeons. Activity. Oh, and Avalonian dungeons. Adventurers. Think about how good this is going to be in Avalonian Raids. And look at the amount of items that they showcased. Look at, look at this bar. There's a lot more loot over here. The estimated market value, ignore that. That's just broken. But this might be really good. Like, yeah, I was thinking about open world mobs, but you're right. Static dungeons, Avalonian dungeons, group dungeons, 8.3 group dungeons. Depends on the activity in the local that region. That is super good. As well as connected regions. This means guilds also benefit from activity in connected static dungeons. The robe alone is 1.5 mil. Oh, is it? Then I was right. We're looking at over <laughs> 2 mil. Initially, it seemed too high. That's why I went a little bit lower. As well as gathering and fishing. Basically, any time a loot item is just generated or a resource is harvested, there is a chance for the same type of item to also appear in the activity bonus chest. 
The chest fills at the beginning of prime time, however the owning guild can only loot it at the end of prime time and it can be looted by any raiders that make it to the territory tower. I love that, I love that because you have a strong incentive to actually raid one of those chests if it's worth it. Of course means you want to have strong walls and strong guards to keep raiders out of your territory. All in all, fortifications represent a major change in how territory battles play out in Albion Align. Guilds can strategize which upgrades to prioritize based on their own battle tactics and the natural environment of their territory. Which unfortunately dictates the layout. Attackers can explore new strategies and new builds which may be successful in breaching fortifications. And the no, activity... it looks cool. It looks cool, but I was just hoping to be something a little bit more, uh, you know, with a little bit more freedom. Bonus chest might reprioritize which territories are attractive to hold and how to treat players that enter your local region. Now that we're at the end of this video, it's I have a good idea of what fortifications are and how they will change Albion's territory battles. I'm super curious about that as well. On April 15th. Of course, as the update name suggests, there are plenty of opportunities to expand upon this feature with new ways to attack or defend a territory. Like Siege Engine? But that's a topic for another time. For now, hopefully next time. At the same time, I kind of want a solo player update, so, you know. We're very much looking I'm not forward sure. To like a road update would be nice. Construction of the first fortified territories at the start of the next season, and we're very excited to see what fierce siege battles arise. Well, there's not going to be very fierce siege battles because you all are not adding siege engines. Adventurers, here's what I'm thinking. I very much like what they're doing. I like the direction. But this whole update, for the most part, feels like exactly the name would suggest, a foundation. It doesn't feel like... Um, how do I say this without sounding uh, unhappy? Because I am happy about it, but it doesn't feel like an update. It feels like the preparations for an update. Which is not bad considering the fact that they want to do smaller updates and so on and so forth, and they also have a literal European server launching very, very soon. But I think it's not, uh, like, I think they should have done some things, little things maybe, or maybe they're more complicated than I think, that would have made a big difference. The first thing would be allow players to actually shape the territory. Allow us to build the walls. If you already have the structure of the walls, allow us to build it. I understand you kind of need the elevation so that players can go through, but at the same time, do you really need the elevation? Can the elevation actually be um, uh, integrated? into the player built environment like players building platforms and so on and so forth allow players to have freedom in my opinion it's a question of um, how do i say this perspective imagine this right now the territory is basically this an elevated platform and on this elevated platform well you can essentially have uh, let's say some natural walls you have to build some um, you have to build some of your own walls but you have some more natural walls over here and so on and so forth like it all feels pre-made and it all feels like you're just upgrading it whereas what i was expecting when i first heard this is basically just a square and inside of this square you can build whatever you want so if you want to build a wall perfect you build a wall and the wall has depth the wall has height the wall has whatever you want and if the invaders break through this wall and create a breach in this wall then all of a sudden, that wall is just left with a hole in it. It doesn't, like, you don't need that elevation. It's nice to have, but you absolutely don't need that elevation necessarily. And if you want the players over here to not be, I mean, if the players over here want to not be at a disadvantage, perfect. Then they have to build some ladders so that they can actually climb on top of the walls. But... In my opinion, this would have given the players a lot more opportunities to actually customize the territories. I'm not sure what are the technical limitations of this, but at the same time, I feel like it would have been worth it to make something like this instead of an elevated box. Now, it's not bad. I'm still very much excited for this. It's still going to be an update that actually might make me become a gear player. At the same time, I've said that plenty of times, so don't take my word for it, adventurers. Uh, but it would have been much nicer to have something like this. Firstly. Secondly, the addition of some basic siege engines would have been super nice. We don't need anything over the top. Just allow us to have a ram for the door. Simple as that. Allow us to have a ram for the door. You have the system for the mounts. You have systems for mounts that can hold abilities. Just make a ram mount, essentially, like a battle ram mount, uh, ran by multiple people, let's say, and they all have to channel the mount so that the mount uses the ability. And the ability does exactly as much damage as 10 players would do. 
something like that like super simple system again i'm not sure how simple the system is but on paper it seems super simple now in actuality it might be more complicated than we actually think but some of those little things would have made those upgrades feel much more epic also another thing why don't you allow us to move the gods like okay maybe you don't want to change the box shape maybe maybe you want the territory to still look like let, let me delete some of this so i can have some space maybe you want the territory to just look like a box all right that's fair but why can't i move the objects on top of this box allow me to take the gods from over here and place them over here like everything has a pre-made spot and i don't like that because it doesn't create freedom and it's not really in the nature of a sandbox game also add a patrol mode like allow me to okay maybe the patrol mode is hard to code maybe you just have to you know select certain spots in which the gods move to and stuff like that. that's complicated but allow me to move them like for example if i want to enforce this wall like crazy and this wall like crazy but this wall is a weak one allow me to place all the gods over there like why not you know, it's the bare minimum that unfortunately we're not really getting with this. Now, is it still exciting? Yes. Is it as exciting as it would have been under the normal circumstances? Not really. So, adventurers, let me know what you guys think about this as well uh, in the comment section down below. Again, this is not to kill the hype. I'm still very much hyped for this, but I just, I was just hoping for something different. So, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. What is the feature that you're most excited about and what do you feel about the current layout of the territories? An important note is that what I'm saying with the actual player build cities, essentially, that I was expecting with this update, it might still be coming in a very future update because as Robin himself has says, this is the foundation. It's not the end product.